Well, this morning, I'm excited to be here studying this week, reading this week in James. I hope that you also have been uh, reading along with us and studying and taking time and dissecting this because we know the Word is awesome, the Word speaks to us, and when we get into the Word, the Word changes us. And so today we're going to be talking about James chapter 1, uh, and we're going to be in 19, verse, uh, 19 through 27 today, and continuing this series on wisdom for the everyday stuff of life. Because we believe that the Word of God is not just great words, and it isn't just a place to memorize and to, um, to put on cue cards and try to, to get it inside of us. It's, it actually is applicable to everyday stuff. Yes. And so we want to encourage you to be in the Word of God and to pray for wisdom. Remember in week one, it says that if anybody lacks wisdom, if anybody lacks the ability to apply who God is to their everyday stuff of life, then they ask, and God, finding, uh, not finding fault in anybody, gives wisdom to those who ask Him. So I said, you know what, I'm going to start asking, God, give me wisdom. I want to know how to apply the knowledge of who you are to my everyday stuff of life. So today, let's look together, James chapter 1, and we're going to be starting in verse 19. This is right after the section about temptation, and hopefully you were encouraged uh, over the last uh, two weeks talking about trials and, and temptation. How do we overcome that by the Word of God and by the Gospel? So if you, have, if you missed those, they're on our website, uh, capitalcitychurch.org, and you can go to the recent messages, and they're all right there. So uh, let's look today, James chapter 1, starting in verse 19. It says this, My dear brothers and sisters, Take note of this. Alright, when he says take note of this, we should pay attention, right? Take note. It says this, Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because hum human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourself, do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word, but does not do what it says, is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror, and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom, the gospel, and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed Amen. in all that they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongue deceive themselves, and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the Word of God, or by the world. Polluted by the word of God. Polluted by the world. God's word cannot do this. I pray that today's word, that his word goes forth in power, and that it ministers us and challenges us to be more like him. Amen? Amen. All right. So what we see here, James, Pastor James, has been speaking to us over these weeks about temptation and trials, but here we find another passage where Pastor James, I like calling him Pastor James, but it seems that, you know, like a, a pastor is one really that cares for uh, the individualist, cares for the growth of the individual. And so he, he says, it, and in this next passage, we're going to find that, that uh, Pastor James is encouraging us that our behaviors, what we do, reveal what we believe. And we've mentioned that before, as a community, we say that uh, what we believe uh, dictates what we do. We don't want to just be a people that talks about everything that we do. We don't have a list of do's and don'ts. We want to say, all right, who is God? What is He doing? What is our belief in Him saying about how we should live and how we should act? He wants to be but if you and I were to examine our lives a little bit, we would know sometimes there's a gap between what we say we believe and what we really believe as expressed in what we do. Yes. All right, so we can say we believe, and sometimes we're talking about this, we're talking about the gospel message, right? We can say, hey, we believe that God is in control. I can say that, but then sometimes when we act, doesn't really line up with the belief that God is in control. Because, wait, I have anxiety, I have fears in my life. This is so powerful, these testimonies about 
what the encounter and trick was. It, it was something that, man, the, the truth of God, the, these, they're not like great wisdom, great like mysteries that we're going to be talking about. They're simple truths about closing doors, about sins that we have in our lives. And when we deal with them in that such a way, man, they, they cancels them out. And then we're able to live differently, things that we experience differently. So today, James is going to give us some wisdom. How do we bridge this gap? How do we bridge this gap from what we believe in our heart and how we live it? Because what we say we believe must follow in what we do. Yes. If we believe these things about God, it will live out. It will, it will change on how we live our lives. Yes. So let's look here. Verse 19. James <laughs> 1, 19 says this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And if you've studied your uh, Bible a little bit, you could, I, I really encourage you uh, to read through, uh, to read through uh, so, uh, Proverbs. The P. I was like, Peter, Psalms, <laughs> Proverbs. To read through the book of Proverbs. Proverbs is a book full of wisdom, just like James. It's really like it has a broad statement that is applicable and true in almost every situation. And so, uh, Proverbs, we remember there's some, also some things uh, about the power of the tongue. And, and the, it says that the wise person is the one that listens before he speaks. So again, James is saying, remember, uh, to be slow to speak. Be slow to become angry. But to be, uh, but to be quick to listen. Yeah. So we have to ask ourselves sometimes. How have I been? How, have I been uh, slow to speak? Have I been quick to listen? Have I been uh, quick to get angry in my life? It says this, that if we do this, if we are one that is slow to speak and slow to become angry, that it, it produces righteousness because hu uh, human anger, it doesn't produce righteousness that God desires. So I don't know about you, there's very uh, a few times when I'm angry that I look like the Holy Son of God. <laughs> Usually when I become angry, it's a, an aspect of anger is that I become slow to be attentive to the other people around me. Right? And I shut down my ability to listen, and I, I want to observe myself. I want to observe what I want. Uh, I become angry. I want to control the situation. But this says here that that does not anger, doesn't produce the righteousness of God. I said, oh, wow, well, I, I, if my goal is in life that I would become more and more like Jesus, if I would become the righteousness of God, then I have to examine myself and say, I've got to change some of the things I do, that I would become somebody that is slow to speak, slow to become angry, and quick to listen, quick to gain, to gain understanding of what people are saying to me. And we talk about, um, this, is, this is an important um, aspect for us, uh, I just want to say something. But let's go here. I have a slide here about the righteousness of God. If we've got to, if we're going to understand um, this, it was really fun on Friday night. Is that that these uh, people that have never heard the gospel or are trying to figure out the gospel? They're asking really simple questions. I, I, I remember I was talking to Rosie this morning, and, and when she said it again, it, they, they're asking like things that I wouldn't think about. Like, okay, so. Uh, we, we told the story of Noah on Friday night and how all the land was wicked, but Noah found favor because he was faultless before God. And he and his family uh, were able to, to enter into uh, the boat and were saved. And so they, and then uh, Rosie mentioned, and a couple other mentioned, they're like, so, like, so if I'm good, then does that mean my whole family is okay then? And they were like, well, no, let's, let's talk about this. It's really good for us, though, to also be in the habit of asking these type of questions. So when we see here that anger doesn't produce the righteousness of God, then, we, then it's important for us to ask, well, what is the righteousness of God? What is this pursuit that I am going after? So uh, on the slide above, we'll see the righteousness of God. So when is it that my uh, life follows the desires of God? That was a question I had. they had. What is the desires of God for my life? If I'm supposed to follow after God, what does it mean? What does God desire for me? What is His will they're asking? And so this is, this is it. What is the righteousness of God? It's thinking, speaking, and acting in a way that represents what God is like and what God has done or would do. Mm -hmm. So when my life 
is reflecting where my life, and when I'm living in the righteousness of God, as if the righteousness of God, and my life will, the things that I think about, the things that I say, the things that I do, they'll be in line with what represents who God is. His good, perfect, and pleasing nature. When I say things, when I do things, they will all line up with who God is. In other words, when people are watching my life, they should see a representation of who God is. And if I'm being honest at all, when I get angry, <laughs> there's a representation that doesn't quite look like who God is. And Pastor James is saying, be careful. Be slow to speak. Be slow to share what you ought. You know, sometimes I'm just eager to get the... I don't know, you get the first word or the last word in, right? Or I've got to finish that statement for you. It says, no, actually, be, some, be quick to be one that listens. Why? Because the Father is one who cares. And the Father's example, the Father's example is that He hears our hearts and that He shows mercy. Amen. Not one to be quick to anger. Let's continue going on, All right? We could we could talk about uh, really wise people that say that anger is a spirit that never is attentive. When anger comes in, listening usually flies out, right? Because when I'm angry, I'm always wanting to assert myself. I'm always wanting to have my way and what I want. I'm, I, it's usually an attitude of pride, the reverse of what. God is. God is one that is humble, that gave up his life for the sake of, for the sake of us. And, it says, and then it continues this thought about being, uh, 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 continues this thought in verse 21. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. I mean, each of these first three verses, I'm like, I need some help. I want to I wanna get this thing right. Verse 21, Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you. I, I don't know about you, but there's things in my life that I'm aware of, all right? Sometimes it takes us to have an encounter. I love uh, what she was saying, and I was, it's the time where we write down all of our sins. Some of us, we can right away, we're like, okay, I know my faults, right? But, but for some reason, sometimes, apart from a retreat, apart from an encounter with God, man, we love to hold on to these things that are not like the righteousness of God. In Isaiah chapter 30, verse 22, he was talking to the Israelite people, and he's telling the Israelite people to get rid of your idols. And then he says this crazy statement. He says, get rid of them like they were a menstrual rat. Now, I don't know about you, but I hate taking out bathroom trashes. Or I was noticing this morning uh, during worship time, awesome, amazing fatherly moment, Botan uh, was taking care of his son Simon, and he went outside and he changed Simon's diaper. But I noticed something when Simon came back, uh, when, when Botan came back in with Simon. He didn't have the diaper with him anymore. Right, there was, a, there was an immediate reaction. You know, if you've changed a diaper, I've, I've changed some diapers too. And so you, you change a diaper, and what's your immediate response to after changing the diaper? Well, one, you, you kiss the baby, right? Oh, you, great job, you put the clothes back on. But immediately after that moment, what happens? Man, I get rid of that diaper! Man, immediately, I, I mean, it's filthy, it's dirty, it's ugly, and I want to clean my hands, even though I love my child, and they produce this wonderful mess that's created here. But I mean, I want to get rid of it! And, and Jay, Pastor Jim is saying, therefore, if, you're, if, our goal, if our belief is that our life should look like who God is, it says our response should be, we should get rid of all moral filth and evil that is so prevalent. I'm glad that we have a diaper dispenser and we have trash cans outside that we can take care of this, right? And I'm glad that it, when we're in the restrooms and I'm thinking that there's a certain spot that... that uh, yucky things can go, dirty things can go, so that I don't have to hold them, that we don't have in this room a whole bunch of dirty diapers and menstrual rags. Yeah. Right? We get rid of the filth. James encouraged us to do the same thing spiritually. 
These things that you know in your life that don't line up with who God is and, and His character, His righteousness, get rid of them. It's like he's, he's almost asking us rhetorically, why are you holding on to this stuff? You know it's not worth anything. Yeah. It's smelly, it's stinky. Yeah. Get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word kind of in you, which can save you. But one of these things about listening to the Word of God, we, we must be a people that are willing to, to hear the Word of God, but it goes beyond just hearing the Word of God. So we have to be hearers of the Word. We have to be ones that are listening, listening to the Holy Spirit. We're, we're slow to speak. We're, we're slow to be angry. We're, we're listening to His voice. We're, we're listening to the words on Sunday morning or in, the, in our daily devotion time. But it doesn't stop there. Paul, uh, James encouraged us to continue in this. We aren't just hearers of the word, we're not just listeners, but we are ones that receive the word. There's an important contrast to this. Ones that hear what is spoken, and ones that receive it. Yeah. Take it to heart. Put it into practice. Sometimes we are guilty of confessing the truth, but never truly believing it. We must put away the, the things that are, are not of God and receive the implanted word that is able to save our soul. This word, we know the gospel, in Ezekiel 36, it says that it is able to plant a new heart in us. Give us a new heart, Ezekiel 36. That's, that's what Pastor described, that's what Rashid described. Then after I was cleansed, all of a sudden I, I get up and everything is different. There, there's joy in my life. There, things are greater, things are brighter. There's a weight that's lifted off of me, right? This is what it means. I, when I receive that, when I actually take a part of it and it becomes of who I am, then things become new. Ezekiel says, we get a new heart. In Isaiah 31, it says that, that the law now is written on our heart and it becomes like a seed producing life inside of us. Amen. So just hearing the word, just having knowledge about what, what the word of God says, it's one thing. It, it does give us maybe some benefit because, okay, we have knowledge and, and maybe there's times that we can contrast, okay, that's like God, that's not like God, I can have that, have that debate in my head. But there's another thing where I say, okay, I don't just know this, I receive it. It's who I am. It's part of me. James is encouraging us to get to this point in verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word and deceive yourselves. This is the hard thing, you know, growing up my whole life in the church, or other people that have talked about growing up in the church, and we've heard a lot of sermons. I went to Bible college, I, mean, I, got, I had to go to chapel every single day. I was listening to a sermon every single day. Two on, two on Wednesdays, because I would go to church, and one uh, more on Sunday, and then if I was in a class, I was listening to two more. And I was hearing a lot. It's not about hearing. Because oftentimes, when we hear it, we are deceived. Because we aren't putting it into action. We aren't receiving it for ourselves. We're not submitting ourselves underneath these words that are spoken. But when we receive it, man, we're born again, right? We become alive. It's exciting in our life. The seed of DNA of all that we need to be like the righteousness of God is implanted inside of us when we hear the Word of God. The, 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 all the ingredients that are needed for us to live a righteous life like Jesus are already implanted in us. When we come to know Christ through the gospel, and as we continue to hear the word, that it's, those are the ingredients we need to live rightly. So three things, how do we, how do we get to this point where it produces in us? Well, one is, we've got to understand, we've got to believe that we're not lacking under any. There's nothing more that we need to receive. What we, ha what we have to produce righteousness is already in us. But two, we also have to take some action. We've got to put off the wickedness. We've got to put it off. And we must realize that we have what we need. Now we must submit to it. Right? Again, this is, it is it, it's this idea that we don't, we don't hold on to dirty diapers and, and dirty used menstrual wraps. We get rid of them. So some of us in this room, this might be a reminder to you, there may be some things that you need to put off, that you need to get rid of. 
Maybe there's some things that you need to stop listening to that would influence the way you live. Maybe there's some things you need to stop watching. Maybe there's some conversations that, that you need to stop having. Maybe there's some actions that you need to stop doing. You need to get rid of them as if they were a dirty diaper. Throw them away. We kind of joked last week about a, a video, and it was this pastor uh, getting up before the crowd, and he says, you know, uh, men, stop, you guys are making me look bad in front of God, and he says, stop it. And sometimes we say, well, that's, really, that's it's, it's a joke because we don't want to just have behavior modifications, but James is saying here, stop it. Get rid of it. It's not worth anything to you. It's not adding value your righteousness. Third thing that we need to do if we want to we want to start receiving this and not just listening to it is that we can continue reading here. It says that we need to receive it with meekness. So verse 23. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks in a, his face in a mirror. And after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be saved. And they will be blessed in all that they do. So if we want to be blessed in all we do, we must examine ourselves in the Word, and we must receive it with meekness. Verse 21 says that they must humbly accept the Word that's planted in us. So this means, this meekness, what does this meekness mean? This meekness, if we were to receive it with meekness, we are to receive it with desperation, acknowledging our hope, hopelessness without it. We, we must get to the point that we've gone to the end of ourselves and know that the only way that we are to live this life is if we were to receive, if we are to submit, if we can get this word implanted in us. We've got to get to that point where we say, I can't do anything by myself without the gospel. I am nothing Without you, I need you. Amen. Meekness is not a place of weakness, but it is a place of, of desperation. It is a place of recognition that I need this word. Yes. That I can't do anything unless I get it. Yes. Amen. If I don't get it, I, I, my life is a mess. I, I must receive it. Those who humbly accept this planted word, it will save you. It will transform you. It will make you more like Christ. It's not just a promise of yesterday, and it's not just a promise for our future. It's a promise, it's a word for my everyday life. We must get to the point where, in my everyday moment, I say, I must have to receive Jesus, your word. Hallelujah. I must, I have to submit to everything that you say is true. And when we get to this point, we receive the word that saves us. But so often, sometimes we have a conversation like this with God. And this is what I, I am encouraged to speak as I read James. Sometimes we come before God and we've been walking with God for a while and, you know, we have this issue. We have this dirty rag. We have this diaper. We have this sinful behavior and we come before God and, we, and, and God says, oh, what about that issue? And how many of you, sometimes I, I tell God, and maybe you recognize the same conversation, oh God, you don't have to go there. But I, I brought this into this relationship. I kind of like this. It's kind of a comfort for me. Yeah. You know, sometimes Ashley was saying, sometimes it's something I'm not even aware of. It's a fear that I've always had, and I thought this was just normal for me. 
Sometimes there's a sin that I've had, and I've said, man, I've get, become so comfortable with, me, with it. I, it's okay that I have it along. When God tries to address it, I'm like, well, God, it isn't, really isn't that bad. It, it actually is kind of beneficial for me. It actually kind of relieves my stress. It actually kind of helps me out. It gives me a little joy. It brings me some happiness. And it says, hey, there's an addiction in your life. There's a sin. There's, there's maybe a, there's some kind of sex and perversion. There, there's some kind of thing that's taking you away from me. And you're like, but I kind of enjoy it. Yeah. So tell God, don't touch that. There's things that God wants to address. There's things that God wants to bring freedom into our life. There's things that God wants us to get rid of so that he can implant in us the better. Remember, we just, uh, James would just encourage us that every good and perfect thing that comes from above. There's good things that he, want to re he wants to replace and give us in our life, but it only comes at a point when we get to a place of desperation that we say, God, I need you and I want what you want for my life more than anything else that I'm holding on to. Amen. Anyone who listens to the word of God, they deceive themselves if they don't do what it says. If they don't take God and say, yeah, God, I want that. Sometimes I interact with people and they're saying, you know, I, I really don't need all of the gospel implications. Because, you know what, in my life I've done pretty good on my own. I've, I've made it this far. I mean, i got a good family. i got a good situation going on. i got a good job. I've, I mean, I've done all these things. But we forget that even in that, we need the gospel. Why? Because if we, if we understand the gospel, the gospel says that everything that I have is from God. That he's the one that created me. He's the one that gave me the ability to do what I'm able to do. So even in, in my, I guess, perfection, or even in what I think is a perfect situation, there's still a place that we can be desperately in need of the Father to complete the work that he began in me. Yeah. Do we believe that? The very things that we're able to do and achieve is because of an act of God's grace in our lives. Yes. So it, it turns us into a moment of thanks, thanksgiving to God. God, thank you. So our, our, our meekness here says, man, thank you, God. You're the one that has done this in me. And it removes any opportunity for anger, for pride to come up in our lives. It's not just forgiving us from our past. And it's not just giving us a hope for the future. This message, this gospel of James is telling us again, it's for our everyday life. So if we believe this, if we believe we can't just be hearers of the word, that we also have to be receivers of the word, then we can get to the point of being doers of the word. So we hear the word, we listen. We receive it, we say, oh man, it is better for me. I want to submit my life to it. But then third, last thing that, that James encourages us, once we get to this point, once we've received it, we say, yes, God, I'm willing to submit underneath what you want for my life. I'm willing to get rid of my, of my filth and I'm submitting myself fully to you. Then we become doers of the word. To be doers of the word, we must first submit to the word of God. To be doers of the word, we must submit to the word of God. We must receive the word of God. We must put ourselves under the authority of Christ and be willing to faithfully fulfill all that he has for us. In Ephesians, says, in Ephesians it says that it is by grace that we are saved. But it also says that he is, he is working to will and to do the good works that he has in place in store for us. So there's something that we're to walk in. It's not simply stopping with receiving what we received in Christ, but now he's prepared for us things for us to do, good things for us to walk in. We do what we believe. 
So we've got to ask ourselves sometimes, well, what do I really believe? If we were to look over the last week and how I acted and the, and, and the different actions that I had, the different ways that I treated my family, the different ways that I interacted with my spouse or my children, the different ways that I interacted with my coworkers, what would that say about the belief in, that I have? Or would that show the unbelief in my heart? See, again, this is a gospel thing. In John chapter 16, verse 9, it talks about Jesus. He was talking about the Holy Spirit, the one that was going to come. And, and part of what he was going to do was the Holy Spirit was going to come and convict us of sin according to our unbelief in Jesus. So if we find ourselves, hey, there's things in my life that aren't, I'm not acting right, I'm not doing right, there's things where I've mistreating people where I'm, uh, where I'm breaking this idea of that everything I do should show who God is, if there's things in my life that is doing that, then i got to examine, what am I believing about Christ? What am I believing about the Gospel? See, this connects the dots between our external sinful behavior and our internal beliefs of our heart, particularly unbelief in who Jesus is. James is connecting these dots. That, hey, if you're doing something that, that is filthy, like these filthy rags, then it's a symptom that in your heart there's something you don't truly believe about God. You may say it, but your actions don't follow in line with it. So this is it in verse 23 through 25, is looking at the mirror. Sometimes we look at the Word of God, we, we, we hear the Word of God, we, we've done it to the Word of God, but then we go away and we forget who we are. Not only, it doesn't just tell us the bad things. It doesn't just reveal what the stink is that we're carrying around. It reveals who we are, who we are meant to be, the righteousness that we have in Christ, the love that we're supposed to show, the good things that we're supposed to do. It's all in here. But sometimes we look, no, and we turn around and we forget what it looks like. The cons my concern is, that we have put ourselves too much on the grace of God and forgotten that our actions must also align with the grace that we believe in Him. Again, Ephesians 2 is, is talking about there is good works in store for us. It's not just about our future. It's about our present. What are we doing today that lines up with the thing that we say we believe in? We say we believe that God is, is good. How is that living out in our lives? Are we treating others with the goodness that we receive? We believe that God gathered us together as family. Are we gathering together as family? We believe that God is the one that provides all of our needs. Are we giving to Him what He has required of us? To trust in Him. Are we believing these things? Are our actions showing what we believe? So how do I know, I've asked this question, and some people ask, how do I know if I've been born again? How do I know if these, if I'm really pursuing after the righteousness of God, if, if this is really something that I want to do in my life? And I've asked a few questions. Do you want to be more and more like Jesus? Do you want to be set free from the sins that are entangling you? Do you want to live a life that demonstrates who Christ is? Do you want to be new in your life? Mm -hmm. And if, if the, I, I believe our, our resounding answer to these is yes, I want this. If that's true of you, then, then you are pursuing after Christ. But if you say in these moments and you're like, I'm not sure, it may show that you're maybe not truly believing fully in who He is. That you truly are pursuing after the righteousness of God. Amen. If your response is, I'm not sure, not really, my concern is that you should be. My concern is that you may be falling short of who God has desired you to be. Paul says to the church in Philippi to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Because he will give us the desire to do his good works. Yes. I believe if we want
want to follow after Christ, we must answer these questions with a resounding yes. I want to follow after you. Yes. That means that if we're saying something, that it should affect what we do. If we say we believe something, it should affect what we do. We're not saved by our works, but our works are evident of what we believe. Our works are evident of the work of Christ in our life. Yes. When we're truly saved, man, we desire to be changed more and more to be like Christ. There's a wise man named John, and there's a book in, uh, called the East, East of Eden that he wrote, and he said this about humans in general and the state of who we are. It says, it is one of the triumphs of the human, that he can know a thing and still not believe it. We can know who God is, but not believe it. I hope that would not be true of us. That we would not be a people that know the gospel, that sit here every Sunday hear the gospel, that, that have the word of God and receive it during the week, and we can memorize it and, and tell people what it says, but we don't believe it. We don't allow it to affect who we are and what we do. The scriptures today continue. In verse 26 it says this, those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongue deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after the orphans and the widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. This is one of the few times in, in Scripture, especially in the New Testament, where religion or religious things, activities, are uh, related in a positive way. Usually, in the scriptures, they're, they're talking about the, the dead religion. So those that just uh, know these things, but they don't live it. They they're just go about operating in things, but they have no meaning behind it. James encourages us this morning, he says, hey, this should not be. That we, in this room, those of us that have put our faith fully in Jesus, we are the embodiment of Christ. We are the, the embodiment of Christ. And when people look at us, they should, they should see who God is. They should know His character. They should long after. Those who consider themselves religious yet do not keep a tight ring on themselves, they deceive themselves. And if you, if you aren't able to control yourself, you're deceiving yourself. Christ is in us, and we embody the message. We don't just preach it. We don't just know it. We don't say we live it. We don't just we don't just tweet about it. We don't just Facebook about it. We don't we we are ones that live it. We live this out. We live this message in every way that we treated each other. We treat our coworkers. We live the message of love. We cannot hate our brother. We cannot hate our neighbor. We we cannot do these things. Martin Luther says, we, we can't make a place lighter by bringing more darkness. Especially if we say, today, 2017, February. But we have to be people that live out the gospel. That this message truly affects how we live, how we treat one another, how we treat our neighbors, how we treat those in our, in our land. This says, religion that our Father accepts is as pure and faultless is to look after the orphans and the widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. we got to watch out what we're listening to today. That we are not polluted by the world, but we receive the Word of God, and as we receive the Word of God, we act it out. That He is love. That He looks out for the widows and orphans or those that are in distress. And the people in our neighborhood and in our city and in our country that are in distress. It says here, those who understand the gospel are going to live it out. I had a conversation 
last week with someone and, and asked about the, the different things that are going on in our nation today. And I said, what, what is our answer? What is our answer going to be of the church? And I said, I'm going to keep on preaching Jesus. I'm going to preach up, keep on preaching the gospel. Because if we receive the gospel, how we live is going to be a demonstration of who he was. It's going to be full of love. It's going to be one that takes action. It's going to be one that's full of doing and, and interceding and going after those that are in distress. It's going to be ones that are slow to, to speak. They're quick to listen. They don't get angry. They don't choose sides. They are ones that speak truth and show love at all times. Yes. Darkness cannot be driven out by darkness, Martin Luther says. Only light can do that. If we want to be people that see change around us, if we want to be people that, that receive others around us, we've got to be ones that embody this message of the gospel and do love. Next week we're going to be doing a sermon series, doing a sermon, continuing in James. I think it's so timely that we're going through the book of James. Because next week, chapter 2, is all about not showing favoritism. So we're going to be talking about uh, next next week about discrimination. Wisdom when facing discrimination. It's like right in order. I love this. God's so good. We were thinking about this last fall when we were talking about James. And God is aligning this for this time. Let's do something, people. Let's live out the gospel. You want an answer for what, how we should do things? Be God. Be the embodiment of Christ, the righteousness of Christ. Show love. And it's going to change things around us. So for ones that receive this word, for ones that live this out, the promise to us in these, in these verses is that we will be blessed. For, for those that aren't just hearers of the word, but receive the word and do it, they receive it, they submit underneath it, and they do it. It says here, in verse, at the end of verse 25, whoever looks intently into the perfect law and the gift frees them, and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Amen. The promise for us. We will be blessed in what we do if we don't just hear the word of God, but we receive it, we implant it, we submit to it, and we live it out. Now this is true. I know this passage, it goes from a real personal moment then to a real public moment, and it, it, it kind of maybe sometimes seems it's, it's, it's switching gears, but it, it, this, they will be blessed, and what they do refers to not only is it receiving the word of God that I may act right, but as far as towards other people, but I may act right also in my in, in getting rid of my sinful nature. So remember that when God asks us to get rid of this thing that we love and is dear to us, this, this action and this behavior that doesn't line up with our belief in who He is, He says, when we get rid of it, when we submit ourselves fully to Him, we'll be blessed. Then, I think this is also a promise to, as we act right, as we do towards others full of love, as we act right in our homes and in our co-workers and in our family, we'll be blessed. And sometimes I need that reminder because sometimes I think when I'm doing good, I'm facing this persecution that James was talking about and, and sometimes me doing good is hard for me and it, it causes me to not always get what maybe my, my flesh desires, but I must remember that I'll be blessed and it will be good for me. As I'm doing this hard thing, as I'm doing this counterculture thing, as I'm doing this thing that is full of the gospel, it will be good for me. It, I will be blessed in it. When I choose the hard way, and it's it maybe a, a difficult situation that causes pain for my family and the provision that I have for my family, or, or maybe I, I'm doing something that my family would rather, rather not, it, it's going to be good for me. I, I, I want to be blessed because of it. So, uh, so awesome, the innocence of the hearts of those that are, we're meeting with on Friday nights. One of the ladies came to me afterwards. She's leaving to go back to China in four days. And so we've had, we may have talked to her for just a, a, a month now. And she's just, she's really trying to get this. She's, she's really trying to understand. So she comes 
up to me to afterwards, and she said, so if, if I do good, or if I do the desires that God has for me, then I will, then I will live forever? That was her question. Then I will live forever? And so then I was able to introduce to her the thought that it isn't just that you will live forever if you believe on God, but that we all live forever. Yes. It depends, the, the, this moment, this importance of submitting ourselves to God is, the importance is, is, is not just will we live forever, we're going to live forever. It's whether we're going to live forever united with God or apart from Him. They will be blessed in all that they do. We will be blessed when we fully submit ourselves to God because we will be united with Him, both in the future, both in our past, but in our present. We will be blessed. So this morning we need to ask a question. Do you do what you believe? Do you do what you believe? Or in examining yourself, do you find you are doing what you believe? And you find that you don't believe fully on Jesus. Maybe we'll find that we're not fully submitted to Jesus as Lord of our lives. This morning, let's bow our heads and reflect on that. You will always do what you believe. Examine what you're doing. And maybe we'll find that we have not fully submitted ourselves to Jesus as Lord. I want to take a moment to pray. And let's spend a moment meditating on that. What's clear in the Bible is not only that God examines and loves to take away from us the filth. He tells us here in James, get rid of it, toss it out. But what I love about the scripture is that it reveals that we have a Father in heaven that's full of grace. Not that we can abuse it, use it for our own desires, and go live our own lives, and then come to Him and just receive His blessings. But His grace is there for us when we examine ourselves and find we are not like Him. Our actions do not show that we fully believe in Him. That we can come before Him, and He's full of grace. He takes us as we are. He cleans us up. He makes us beautiful. And He implants in us the word that is able to produce right living. So let me pray as we examine and we can communicate to God and we can come before him and say, God, take away this filth. Father, fill me with belief in you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning for your word. I thank you that James encourages us to not just be hearers of the word, because when we're only hearers of the word, we deceive ourselves. We must also receive the word that is planted in us. Submit to it fully. And when we do so, our life will look different. Father, as we examine ourselves, we may be honest and say, there's still some doing in my life that doesn't show I believe fully in you, Jesus. Father, I pray that you would begin a work in us where you and I together remove the filth. We get rid of it so that we can look more like you. Father, bless your people now to have ears to hear your spirit as you speak to them. In Jesus' name. I encourage you to take a few moments to examine ourselves to Get rid of those things. Get them to God. I'll return up here in a few moments to close.